PhD, uh, does this stuff for a living, makes some amazing looking walkers. He's here to tell us all about them. This is Dr. Chris Parrott. Actually, you might be controller though, so you basically tell them to go to a position and hope they're there. 
but recently there have been servers like this Adafruit one which give you an extra pin for that and you can also hack normal servos with that pin if you want. Now, you probably want to use a driver for this and there are many options for up to 16 servos but as I mentioned the hexapod is 18 and there's fewer options for that, so like here's an example of <coughs> the Linux Motion one, it goes up to 32. As of yet, I've not seen any hacks of the 32 servos, so that becomes a problem for doing the higher number of motors per leg. Also, mentioning those analog servos, so the analog feedback servos, there are no server drivers that I've been able to find that have connections to those, so you'd have to be aware your own solution if you wanted to go down that route. Now, on the more advanced side, you've got smart servos. So these are specifically designed for robotics. They have a built-in PID loop, which you can tune, and they're on a communication bus, so that means that you can, um, but it makes wiring easy for starting, because you don't need a wire per motor, you just need a wire per leg. And it also lets you read back the angle, current temperature, and other parameters of the motors to make sure they're actually doing what you're doing. But these are quite expensive if you've ever had a look. Right? The Dynamexa ones, they need 50 pounds at the low end, uh, and go up to several hundred from there. Um, so you may want to look at doing DIY. So with what was talked about earlier, get a motor, encoder, driver, microcontroller, and fashion your own server. Or you can buy certain off-the-shelf parts, such as metal media and load drive, which combine the latter three things together, so you just need to supply a motor. Now with that, you, you built, you've decided I'm going to build a robot, um, walking robot, some tips for you. If you're using hobby servos, although this can also apply to little ones, calibrate these servos. By that I mean, figure out what pulse or command you need to send to it to get the actual ni minus 90, plus 90, zero degrees. I wouldn't recommend just getting minus 90 or plus 90, because that's assuming the range will be linear, which you can't guarantee. I've found having those, uh, those three values at a minimum Give your calibration look up to be quite useful and make some sort of jig like that for doing the calibration. If your robot's heavy though, then you may want to actually calibrate the robot at the motors in place on the robot and add some jig or some such to the side. So here's what I've really printed. Uh, I recommend actually calibrating the robot upside down because then gravity <coughs> will be acting on the calibration and that should alleviate <coughs> some of the steady state offset with the uh, um, cheaper motors. So at least it's working in the direction you want it to. Go for metal gear servers if possible. They'll last a lot longer. They can still break, but then it's usually other parts of the motor that break before the gears in that case, as I found. Uh, or you blow your motors if it's just to get the wire on top of it. The gears will be fine if you get a metal gear. Also, if your robot is on the heavy side, then maybe you consider adding springs on the legs to reduce the load that they're basically against gravity. Oh, and it may be tempting to have your um, heaviest parts sorted to the back of, like, if you've got a particular theme you're going for, but then you put in disproportionate load upon the legs, so really have your mobility batteries or heaviest parts at the middle. Now, going on out to walk, and this is meant to be a video, but I don't know why it's playing, but you can see it um, during the lunchtime I've got my simulator running. There's two separate but connected problems. <coughs> the first is, how do you move each leg to touch your position in space? Think of it as just touching with your finger. Um, if that is one problem, and then the second problem is, if you've got all your legs doing this touching, how do you move those points that they're following to create walking? So think of it as the output of problem two goes into the input of number one. Also, if you're going for something like a budget page, you may want to consider how you stay balanced. Answering number one then, we've got inverse kinematics. This is the process of finding the joint angles of the leg that place its end at the target. And as you may guess, this is solvable with trigonometry. So this is at least the one point in adult life I found you can to be useful. And if you're going for three joints, like uh, recommend for a spider, then there's two mathematical solutions, either an over or an underarm. Um, if you've got more joints, then there's 
you tend to dig into the number of solutions, but you can find one by either grouping certain joints together so that they have the same angle, or having some motors point in a particular direction, such as having all the tips point down. Then you're basically reducing the problem back to three joints, and then you can solve that. So with that solving problem one, you then need to find how you actually want the robot to walk. And this is what is known as a gate. And this can be defined as a repeating cycle of steps that are taken by a set of legs to achieve motion in a direction. Mm -hmm. Two examples here. The, you, can, you can think of it as each leg is in either two states, either a striding state where the leg is off the ground or high, and um, a stance state where it's on the ground or low. And yeah, biped, each leg alternates, and for head, only one leg moves at a time, although you can do any pattern of these that you want. And this, I should say, is a cycling thing, so it goes zero to one and then back to zero in a circle, effectively. From this, you will then need to go do gate generation of actually create the walking, which is where we convert that definition into a set of offsets that we want to apply to the points that the legs are touching. And for that, you want to separate what the entry is out into a height and a distance offset. The height offset starts at zero, and as you may guess, ends at zero, going up to a peak height, which can be whatever value you want, during the middle. And you can do any sort of shape there, either for an upside down parabola, because it becomes quite useful for doing rough ground walking. Um, the distance at the start of the stride is all the way backwards, and then as the stride moves forward, goes to the front. Then during the stance, it goes to the back. When you combine these together with the inverse kinematics, you end up with that. Just like for, like for a moment. And you can imagine if you apply this to all four legs of the quadruped, for example, and put it on the ground, this will walk. Now, a brief mention of balancing. <coughs> there are two ways to do it, and I think these videos won't play, so you'll have to look at it afterwards. Um, so in this video, the robot's lifting two legs at a time, and it's balancing with an IMU, so very similar to the balance bolts and the base plant, but it's making continual corrections to avoid falling over. The problem with this is that if your program locks up for any reason, the robot will obviously fall over. The alternative to that, and this is what I've got demo um, out in the robot area, is the static stability, or static balancing, where you move the robot center to the over the legs that are going to be on the ground at the next stride and before you lift the legs so that at any point if it locks up it will just be pause. Yeah, and so to wrap up then and I attempt to answer the title of the talk. If you're looking for a new challenge then I actually I highly recommend it. Not only will you learn a lot of new things about robotics, but you get a cool new robot idea. Whether it's good for the challenges of pilots is up to the community to figure out and figure out the best way to optimise walkers. But maybe in the future years there'll be challenges that take more advantage of their capabilities. So this may be a bit intimidating to get started though, so I have actually put my walking simulator again, this should be a video playing. Um, I put that on GitHub and you'll be able to see it outside as well. Also, I'm planning to work on a custom hat that drives uh, 32 servos and will do everything on board, the walking calculations and everything, so much like the pixie cam, it's just something you'll put on and you'll be able to do the walking. So with that, thank you very much for listening. We can have one question. <laughs> All right. What's the advantage of using the walker in, in pipes as some normally I've seen robots using wheels or tracks? So the in, in a normal in just a normal pipe, not really. When you've got a pipe network with lots of interconnections, the surface becomes not just a cylinder and there may be obstacles to put it politely that you can navigate around. Also, we're looking at having the legs themselves be sensors that we can send vibrations into the ground. So we always have those contact points because we're doing the walking. Okay.
All right, thank you, Chris. We look forward to having you.